Good evening and welcome. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as director of Roosevelt House. And on behalf of Ann Kirshner, the president of Hunter College, I want to welcome you to this very important evening, the first of three planned, much needed discussions about the persistent plague and disgrace of child poverty. And we're honored that our friends at the Invisible Americans podcast, End Poverty Now, came forward to propose a partnership with Roosevelt House that begins this evening. Jeff Madrick, the co-host of the podcast, is here with us tonight, as is his co-host, a great friend of Roosevelt House, who has served as a Grove leader here for our students, uh, the groundbreaking TV journalist, Carol Jenkins. So thank you both. And you will meet the activists and journalists who will be participating tonight when Carol introduces them. Um, but we're particularly proud to welcome back um, the Nobel Prize winning economist and essential New York Times columnist, Paul Krugman. None of this would have happened without the help of another great communicator um, and Hunter College adjunct professor, Gail Yankasek, who is here, and uh, our, our Rita Hauser director of the Roosevelt House Human Rights Program, Jessica Newworth, who is sitting there. Before we begin, just a word about this setting, particularly since some of you are first time visitors. This is, as you probably know, the original New York City home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor, whose human rights work started when she lived here, commencing with volunteer work at the settlement houses on the Lower East Side, whether it was because uh, the kindling of her humanist spirit or because she wanted to get away from her mother-in-law who controlled the house is anyone's guess. But it was a career that culminated with the UN Declaration of Human Rights, whose 75th anniversary we are going to mark this year in a program that the aforementioned Jessica Newworth is organizing and about which you'll hear more soon. So 80 years ago, next month, um, after the elder Mrs. Roosevelt died, Eleanor engineered the sale of the house, not really a sale, it was something like $50,000, of this house to Hunter College, and we have been here ever since. Uh, it was first a kind of a retreat for clubs, a place for social gatherings and dances, uh, and then, of course, it evolved into a public policy institute when it was refurbished. But FDR, um, who made the library upstairs where we all gathered a few minutes ago, his presidential transition headquarters from 1932 to 1933, um, this was the site where he, together with his brain trust and most notably Francis Perkins, crafted the foundational building blocks of the New Deal, uh, exploring programs that, among other things, like building buildings at Hunter College and other places, had a direct impact on child poverty during the worst economic downturn in history. Concepts that evolved into the National Youth Administration, targeted childhood education aid through the Federal Emergency Relief Act, the building of 1,000 new libraries and 6,000 schools across the country, not to mention Francis Perkins' programs on minimum wage, maximum hours, prohibitions on child labor, a trend we've seen moving in the opposite direction in recent years. Um, and perhaps most important of all, out of the New Deal came the Aid to Dependent Children program under Social Security. Not a perfect roster of programs, but an astonishing start uh, in a country that had no social safety net until FDR. Speaking of in influential people, if you just want to throw up my one slide, um, we lost uh, yesterday uh, a great woman who has been a very important part of Roosevelt House and all of its programs, Anita Summers. Anita Arrow Summers, who I just found out this afternoon, died yesterday at the wonderful age of 98 and change. Um, 
You will see her name on the plaque outside the Four Freedoms Room. She also um, worked to create programs, graduate research programs for students. And she was actually a founder of the original curriculum of the public policy program at Hunter College. Um, she has a, a great legacy. Her husband won the Nobel Prize in economics. Paul, as you may know, her father won the Nobel Prize in economics. The only reason Anita didn't win the Nobel Prize in economics is she took 15 years off to raise Larry Summers. Uh, and um, the result was Larry and, and, and John and Rick. So she was a little bit held back in her career and got terrible job offers when she went back into the workforce. But she ended up at the Wharton School and was an extraordinary uh, teacher and for us a benefactor who, whom we'll, we'll miss very much. Speaking of the public policy program curriculum that she founded, let me turn the program over to the director of the public policy program, Dr. Basil Smyth. Thank you very much, Harold. Good evening, everybody. Oh, i do that one more time. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, it's good to be with all of you today. Um, thank you so much, Harold, for your, for your words. And um, I'm very proud to be co-hosting this event with my partner here, uh, Jessica Neuer. So a wonderful program, and thank you so much for your partnership and ongoing partnership and collaboration, um, Jessica. Just a, a couple of points about the public policy program um, as well. Uh, for those who have not uh, been to our building before and, and been able to be a part of our programs, we would love for you to come back. Um, come back, come back, come back. I see some of our faculty members, Eri and Michael, good to see you, um, for the wonderful programs that we, that for the wonderful courses that we teach here, but also the wonderful programming. Tomorrow we have the regional director of the Department of Housing and Urban Development coming to talk to our students about uh, urban development and housing policy. Uh, we also, in the next, uh, next early next month uh, or mid-month um, in November, we have the CEO of the National Urban League to come and talk uh, to our students about uh, voting and uh, democratization and civil engagement um, in today's environment. So um, incredible programming, and we invite all of you to come back uh, to hear from our wonderful guests and to meet our students. They could really use a lot of your guidance, your support, your mentorship, um, because our students really do, uh, I would say, if any of them could run for office today, they would. They're amazing, uh, there's amazing talent, amazing energy, and we're just here, we're not engineers, we're shepherds. We're just here to sort of shepherd them through these uh, few years of Hunter and to get them out into the world and make sure that they're successful. But we want you to be a part of that effort. So again, thank you for being here, but uh, we would love to see you come back and support a lot of the work that we do here. Um, I have the, uh, I don't have much of a, uh, a speech today. All I get to do is introduce two amazing people, but I will tell you they are really amazing people. So I'm very proud of this moment. Um, Jeffrey Magic, the co-host of the Invisible Americans podcast, author of seven books on the economy, including Invisible Americans, The Tragic Cost of Child Poverty, um, who is a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, uh, a New York Times columnist, and an Emmy award-winning television financial analyst. Jeffrey, we are happy to have you with us today. Thank you. And... Carol Jenkins, um, you know, I, I hate, I always hate saying this because I know how it may get received some way by something, but I grew up watching you and I love you. <laughs> and it was thrilling to be able to, about a year or so ago, be on her program at CUNY TV for Black Americans, which she hosted and I was on with Errol Lewis from New York One talking about what, yet again, uh, democratization, civil engagement, uh, and, and, um, and our elections. Um, you are also the co-host of the Invisible Americans podcast, an Emmy-winning former anchor and correspondent, founding president of the Women's Media Center, uh, past president, CEO of the ERA Coalition, uh, which we are very involved with here at, at uh, Roosevelt House, and the co-author uh, with, with Elizabeth Hines of Black Titan, uh, A.G. Gaston and the Making of Black American Millionaire, which is a biography of your uncle. Right. 
wonderful. We are glad to have you and uh, the wonderful um, panelists here today. So thank you all very much for coming. Wonderful to see all of you. <laughs> have a good evening. Jeff, you can join me here, you know. Jeff is always uh, outnumbered by women in our project, so, and I want you to know he's a perfect gentleman. He, I, <laughs> do you want to join me here at the mic, Jeff? Um, although, you know, we fight when we do the podcast, if you've uh, ever had a chance to listen to it, and we hope you will, you know, Jeff really has to fight to get a word in edgewise, you know, but since he is the you know, the expert, you know, we do let him uh, have his uh, have his say. Uh, to Harold and to Basil and to Jessica Newworth, we want to thank you so much for inviting us into the Roosevelt House family. Uh, I do feel that this is the proper home uh, for a campaign to end child poverty, uh, the proper home for a brand new deal. Uh, we believe, uh, as you will hear, in cash, uh, and that that's going to a part of the major, uh, a major part of the solution of our problem. So we're here speaking on behalf of the nearly 13 million children in this country who go to bed hungry at night, who may not have a place to sleep, who may live in a violent environment, and who are invisible. And that's our purpose, as Jeff wrote in his transformative book, and it really is the basis of our work that we do every week. Uh, is to uplift their condition, the fact that getting something done is so hard, uh, but we know now that there are answers, you know, as our panelists will, will tell you. We know what the solution is now. If only we can, uh, we can do it. So Jeff is going to introduce uh, one of our friends, one of our great uh, guests on our, our podcast. So... And he always but, complains about my script. I want you to know that. The, uh, the truth is, I just wanted to extemporize, which I, is what I usually do. But Carol wouldn't let me. She insisted I read the script. So if you find it corny, so do I. <laughs> Among the guests Carol and I have interviewed, Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado led lead sponsor of the American Family Act, which includes reauthorization of the expanded child credit, tax credit. For our gathering, he sent this long message. I'm sorry to try your patience. Hi, everybody. It's Michael Bennett, Senator from Colorado. I want to start by thanking Jeff Madrick and Carol Jenkins for everything they do to highlight the often invisible reality of child poverty in America. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person, but I'm honored to share a few words on why Invisible Americans' advocacy for our kids is so critically important. When I was the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools, I saw every day how growing up in poverty can shape a child's future in ways that are deeply unfair. And as a society, we paid the price. Child poverty costs our country up to $1 trillion a year in the form of more hospital visits, lower earnings, and higher crime. Two years ago, we finally passed the biggest investment in kids and families in more than a generation, the expanded child tax credit. It benefited 62 million kids, cut child poverty nearly in half, and reduced hunger for families by a quarter. And for six shining months, we treated America's children in poverty like they were our kids, not someone else's. But when Congress failed to extend this lifeline, we turned our backs on working families and we turned our backs on their kids. And because of that failure, child poverty more than doubled in the U.S. from 2021 to 2022. Congress plunged five million new kids into poverty. Now, that wasn't an accident. And now families are once again forced to make impossible decisions to put food on the table. That is unacceptable. We know how to end child poverty in this country. It starts with expanding the child tax credit. We have an opportunity at the end of this year to get something done on the child tax credit. And that's where the work of Invisible Americans comes in. The conversations you're having today will be critical to our success. And let me end by saying the richest country should not have one of the highest rates of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. With your help, I'm confident we can find a path forward to end childhood poverty in America once and for all. Thank you. And again, I'm asked, what 
does Paul Krugman think about what you're saying today? This has happened to me countless times over my career. The staff of our podcast has been often asked the same question based on, on our discussions of child poverty. What does Krugman think? This has become, a, uh, has been echoed throughout the economics community. And he has accepted our invitation to speak to us about just that, about the costs of child poverty and what we might be able to do about it. He won the Nobel Prize, as all of you know, for economics in 1988, based on serious innovative trade theory. Since then, he's written authoritatively and plowed new ground on inequality, productivity, health care, deficit spending, and other significant subjects. Lately, he has been writing, maybe to some people's surprise, on falling inflation, crossing swords with many mainstream economists, as is his want. He is surely the best known progressive economist in the world, writing thousands of columns in the New York Times and on other columns on the internet. He adds that he is a firm believer in the welfare state. With that, we welcome Paul for a few comments on this issue. All right. Um, just wanted to say it's a tremendous honor to be asked to start this thing off. Um, and I think an undeserved honor, um, if, if I might say. Um, I am not, well, two things really. Uh, first, child poverty is first and foremost, uh, it's a moral issue. It's not, it's, it's, there are technocratic aspects, but it's not something where your starting point should be to talk about the technocratic uh, aspects of how to do it and what are the consequences. And uh, I am not an activist, I'm not a crusader, I am a, a technocrat. And uh, so that's, uh, in some ways I feel it uh, a little abashed, especially given some of the members of the panel have done so much, um, devoted their lives so much to, to trying to, to make progress on this issue. Um, the other thing is that even as far as the technocratic aspects go, it, I am not an expert on child poverty. Uh, my uh, writing for the New York Times obliges me to pretend to know lots, to be an expert on lots of things, but I am not at all on this. Um, so, I, but I think that I, I want to say just a few things. I do teach, um, I, as, as Jeff said, you know, st my starting thing was international trade. That was my starting career, but I do have moved more and more over the years into issues of poverty, inequality, social justice. Um, and I, at this point, teach a course at the CUNY Graduate Center called Economics of the Welfare State, uh, which is mostly uh, uh, cross-national, because uh, the one thing that's, that is spectacular about that is we have, particularly among advanced countries, we're all kind of equally productive, equally competent, but we make different choices. And so there's a lot of ability to compare uh, what, what, uh, what different countries do. Um, in many of these comparisons, the United States stands out as being you know, especially cruel, I guess is the word. We, we have the weakest social safety net, the, the least generous programs of any major advanced country. Um, but one thing that you do notice in this is that um, US social spending isn't all that low compared with other advanced countries. We're not, we, we do spend less as a share of GDP on, on social programs than others, but it's not as dramatic as you might think. What is really dramatic is that we don't spend on children. The United States has, uh, our, our programs for people my age, you know, we have a actually quite generous single payer healthcare system for people over 65. We have a reasonably not could be bigger, but, but our, our retirement system is not all that underfunded. But if you do a chart of spending on families with children, the United States is off the chart at the bottom. We're just completely, we, we just completely neglect. And, and that is, is shocking because um, uh, children are cheap. Helping children is cheap. You see, you see that uh, certainly on, on issues of health care, right? It, the, uh, the, the cost of providing guaranteed health care to a, a child is tiny. It's, it's compared with that of, of, uh, of 
taking care of, of seniors, and yet we do take care of seniors, and we and many many children fall through the cracks. So that's that's my first observation. The the astonishing failure of the U.S. as a as a society as providing a a floor for all of our people is mostly the the real victims are children. Um, second thing, and uh, Senator Bennett said it for a brief moment there. For a brief moment, we became a kind of normal civilized country. For a, for a few months in response to COVID, we actually created a full-scale uh, social safety net, especially for children. And it is, on the one hand, we showed that we could do it. On the other hand, we proved, unfortunately, that we were not willing to continue it. And uh, what the, the task, and other, others on the, will talk more about how we get there. How do we get back to that? We, we, we proved that we can do it. It's not impossible, but we proved that we can do it. Um, I want to make a technocratic point. I'm not sure if people will fully appreciate this. And actually, it's something I only appreciated in the last couple of years, even though I teach this course every year. Um, uh, we talk a lot about uh, trade-offs between equity and efficiency. That's the old line, um, which uh, you know, at some level has to be true, right? A, a, a society where with with 100% marginal tax rates uh, would would probably not work. Um, but when you talk to people, when you look at people who try to claim that the U.S. has sufficiently high marginal tax rates in some sense that there are a real problem for incentives. It turns out there's, there's no evidence whatsoever that high tax rates, that the tax rates we, we have on high income people are a significant deterrent. It's not, you know, if, if, if you actually work it out, if you're a, somebody earning your income in New York City, as opposed to, you know, a, a, a private equity manager or something, but our high, 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 actually, from, from my favorite line from the movie Wall Street, a 400,000 a year working Wall Street stiff, right? If, you, if you're in that class, you probably face a marginal tax rate of something like 55%. Um, is that, uh, and we all know how lazy and slow moving New Yorkers are, right? There's, there's no indication that the taxes on the rich are, are on the affluent, on the upper middle, upper, upper middle class or lower, lower upper class are a significant deterrent. When people try to make the case that we have really serious incentive problems, they tend to focus on the high effective marginal tax rates created by means-tested programs, which are withdrawn as your income goes up and can create on paper something like 80 or or more percent marginal tax rates. But only occurred to me fairly recently is that the examples used for all of those you know, claims that we have high disincentive effects, are it's almost always uh, a single parent with, with, with children. And my God, are we really worried more about the disincentive effects on single mothers to work than we are about making sure that those single mothers have enough resources to take care of their children? This is the, the whole, uh, so this is something I, that comes up in the course always. And, uh, and I've now realized that those marginal tax rate calculations are applied to exactly the people for whom that should be irrelevant. What matters is the children. Um, and finally, I think as Senator Bennett was alluding to this, it turns out it shouldn't matter. All of this is really just about morality. We should be taking care of children. But it turns out that it's also the case that it's practical to take care of children. Um, one of the funny things that, that I do talk to my students about is that we, uh, there's a sense that investing in physical stuff, steel and concrete and infrastructure, that's real investment in the future. And investing in squishy stuff like make, making sure that kids have adequate nutrition and health care is, you know, well, uh, that's, that's Maybe, maybe it's even woke, I don't know. But anyway, the, uh, um, but the fact of the matter is we have far more evidence for really big social returns to investing in children than we do on anything else. And people on the panel and people in this audience know that that comes because of um, we actually have what amount to natural experiments as programs were rolled out. We really, really know that taking care of children pays off. It probably pays off even in the narrowest fiscal sense in the long run, definitely pays off in terms of society. Um, and um, it's just, I mean, I don't know, people on this panel may have better ideas. I don't know how we get this through, but, but this is what we should be doing. If there was, if there's one thing above all where America falls down, it is in taking care of kids 
And I'm so glad to see this panel and this conference talking about that. Thank you. A good uh, ec economist, he figured out the logistics of getting to his uh, seat. Uh, <laughs> And I, I was telling Janet Gornick, who heads up the Stone Center, where uh, Professor Krugman uh, teaches as a fellow, that I said, you know, actually, can you ask him this? Can you ask him that? I think I'm a little afraid of him. Uh, you know, in awe is the uh, is is the term. We're delighted that uh, that you are you are here. Let me introduce our other uh, presenters today. Holly Fogel a philanthropist and social activist, co-founder of the Monarch Foundation and the Bridge Project with a commitment to supporting mothers and babies for the first 1,000 days, and that's with $1,000 a month. So yes, she, she'll tell you she's doing it in New York but and in Connecticut and in Appalachia and worldwide soon. Maria Hinojosa. Pulitzer Prize, Peabody Award, Emmy Award winning journalist, founder of no the nonprofit Multicultural Communications Project, Futuro Media. How's that? Futuro Media. All right, I'm trying. And author of Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. In a hate torn, and love and hate in a torn America. H. Luke Schaefer, Herman, and Amelie Kahn Professor, an Associate Dean at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan, and he's Director of Poverty Solutions there, and co-author with Catherine Eden and Timothy Nelson of The Injustice of Place, Uncovering the Legacy of Poverty in America. And I recommend both of the books. Luke, Maria, Holly, thank you all so much uh, for being here today. Um, I'm going to start with Luke because he had breaking news today. We had a, a briefing call this morning, and he said very nonchalantly, oh, you know, we're going to be at the White House tomorrow uh, presenting, and uh, we're all like, about child poverty? Uh, really? So Luke, if you could start with, with you and tell us a little bit about what's up this week in, in, in Washington. Sure. So I have two things that I'm incredibly excited about. The first is my book, The Injustice of Place. It's a follow-up to a book I wrote with Kathy Eden called $2 a Day a number of years ago. Uh, but this book really looks at our regional disparities. Uh, in some places in the United States, the American dream is alive and well. If you grow up poor, you're just as likely to rise to the middle class. And in other places, if you grow up poor, you're going to likely to be poor as an adult. So how do we deal with these uh, deep, deep differences? Differences in life expectancy that are more than a decade, depending on where you live, sometimes even more in small areas of geography. So we're going to be talking about that in this project that, much like $2 a day, started with data, but then ended with deep ethnography and a lot of historical analysis, because these regional differences did not just appear out of thin air. There's deep histories that go into understanding where all of our social problems are. Uh, we're going to be talking about that and thinking about all of the ways uh, in this book, which was a book of surprises for me, that we uh, uh, need to address these, these disparities, like uh, local government corruption or social infrastructure. But the other project uh, that is in part in, in inspired by the work that Holly is doing is uh, a new project I'm working on in Flint, Michigan, which is trying to build on the uh, legacy of the expanded child tax credit. We're starting in January, every pregnant mom uh, will receive $1,500. Every uh, expectant mom in the city of Flint, $1,500, and then $500 a month until their baby turns age one. It'll be the first time we've ever done this at a city level. And uh, I'm doing it with Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, uh, and we were able to unlock state funds for that. And so, you know, in this moment where I think we're all mourning the loss of the expanded child tax credit, and obviously there's still a lot of support for it, there are things that cities and states can do uh, to take up the mantle and really sort of live into that call that all three of you really started us off with. Thanks, Luke, for that very much. Holly, if you could pick up your, your mic because I want to go to you. You're, because you've inspired, as Luke says, a lot of this work because it's not just what the federal government can do or states or cities, but it's what individuals can do. And you, I hope you don't mind me saying that you've committed, as a starter, $35 million uh, to the mothers and children of uh, New York and, and beyond. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you came to that. And I want you to know it's hardly any questions asked. And it's 
cash. It's not a promise of a tax deduction. It's cash that mothers can use. Sure it is. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Um, delighted to be with you all, and so delighted to be with you all on this stage. Um, you know, I will say we are baby people first and cash people second is the way we think about it, um, my husband and I. And I think I had been working in the space of early childhood anonymously, quietly, um, for many years in New York City. And when COVID hit, um, some of the work that we were supporting, you know, basically amazing organizations, but they just said, we can't solve these problems fast enough. The city is in lockdown. What do we do? And so um, we funded a bunch of cash, at the moment, just dispersals. And I think what we saw from that was then the beginning of the idea that has become the bridge project because what we saw was that these women used the money very smartly, but also very, very differently. And I think that's one of the keys of when we trust people to know what they need to do for themselves and their families, they make very wise decisions. And particularly when we trust a mother with an infant, she makes very very wise decisions. And so I think for us, um, that was the kernel of what we now call the Bridge Project. Um, we have, by the end of this year, we will have 1,100 mothers enrolled um, across all five boroughs plus Rochester. Um, and we start when they're pregnant and we follow them for the first 1,000 days of that baby's life. And as Carol said, it is completely unrestricted cash. Because I think there are a few tenets that were really important to us. One is this idea of prevent versus undo that Paul was just talking about, Jeff was just talking about, it is so much easier if we are working to have healthy nutrition, access to childcare, access to healthcare in those earliest days than when we try to undo things way down the road with after school programs and prisons and a lot of other stuff. Um, ROI, I'm a finance major, my husband was a finance major, we both went to Wharton, um, he's a venture capitalist. ROI matters to us as philanthropists and as activists and so, um, as Carol said, we have a lot of our own money invested in these mothers, um, and we wouldn't be doing that if we didn't see the results and believe in cash being the most efficient and effective bit. And I would say the final piece for me that is heartfelt, back to morality, to your guys' point, is I grew up in Appalachia, um, about two hours from where um, Mr. Manchin grew up, and the poverty rate in my county today is 29% for children. Um, there are no jobs. It is hard, hard going. But what I saw was a group of resilient women who would come together to bake pies to put a new roof on a church, um, pass a hat to bury someone's child. Um, and I saw women, I think, bring out the better angels, I would say. And so this idea of trusting a group of people to know what they need to do, I think resonates with me at sort of a cellular level. Thank you, thank you for that, Holly. Maria, you're... Uh, we've relied on your voice uh, for so many years to uplift uh, the impoverished, uh, the immigrant population, the, and, and often uh, in the solutions that we're looking at, the immigrant populations are still not included, uh, are still not thought of, and uh, so I want you to talk a little bit about the work that you've done throughout your career to change that. Uh, it's great to be here, obviously. Thank you so much, Carol. It's just, I mean, Carol Jenkins. <laughs> Um, teaching us all how to do it. And also, the truth is, is that journalists never retire. <laughs> this is true. Just true. not in our DNA. It's not gonna happen. Um, so you're an inspiration, Carol. Um, so I actually wanna kind of flip a little bit um, so that you all, so that we're sharing the same kind of data, because this is data that is not necessarily out there in a big way. Like the New York Times is not putting a big headline above the fold that says, oh my God, Latinos and Latinas are the second largest voting cohort in the United States of America. So I'm gonna let you sit with that. Latinos and Latina voters are the second largest voting cohort in the United States. Latinos and Latinas right now, our median age more or less is between the ages of 11 and 12. Okay? About every 60 seconds, a Latino or a Latina turns 18 in the United States of America. Now, if you think about all of that and demographics, Holly and I have become fast friends um, because she's working in Connecticut. And I, I live in Harlem, New York City, but I have a cottage. Very important word, cottage <laughs> in Connecticut. It was lived in by raccoons, but we, you know, 
We come from Harlem. We weren't scared of raccoons. <laughs> She's like, shoo. Um, but the fastest growing demographic in Connecticut, apart from New Yorkers, um, <laughs> was a joke, is Latino and Latina population, right? And so when I go to Connecticut, that's my entry point. And actually, the pandemic changed everything because who would get a manicure in Connecticut, right? But because of the pandemic, I'm now getting a manicure with the Ecuadorian woman who has a small business, who has older kids but just gave birth. Uh, and now I'm connected into a whole other dynamic of these towns in Connecticut, like Watertown, Waterbury, my town is Bethlehem. And just kind of thinking about what I'm seeing transformationally in the state of Connecticut, that most people are like, Connecticut, super wealthy, white, like what's the issue, right? And it's being changed by, if we were gonna sum it, yeah, actually by young Latinos and Latinas who actually 100% believe in the American dream. So there's something that, I mean, I'm not exactly addressing poverty because there's so much potential here, right? Like, I'm, I'm thinking about something that happened, I don't know, in the last 48 hours where there's a possibility that a young person is about to be deported. Um, and it's like this young person was educated, came to the United States undocumented at the age of five, and has been educated in the United States, um, is now working as a dental technician on 145th and Broadway, but he said, eh, if they decide to deport me, eh, I'll go back to Mexico, I'll actually make more money being an, uh, 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 she, actually optometrist technician, I'll make more money in Mexico than I will here. So go ahead and deport me. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Because what we are doing then is actually deporting all of the economics, Paul, that we put into educating this person, getting them to be fully bilingual, unable to afford college, but got into college. And what a waste. Now, if you think about what we're dealing with right now in this city, which is something, I don't know, for the long, like Carol, Paul, I don't know if you've seen this. I came to New York in 1979. I was born in Mexico. I'm an immigrant who became an American citizen, but I have don't remember ever seeing anti-immigrant, anti-refugee protests in front of places with children coming to our city, which makes me think, why is that happening? The investigative journalist in me is like, come on, New Yorkers are like ridiculously busy. We're just going to find time to suddenly come out and start protesting against families? Right? Now you're like, hmm, why is that happening? But the bigger issue is that while people are saying, you know, oh my God, it's going to cost New York, blah, 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 and it's like, actually, these kids, just to focus on the kids, are the ones that our mayor and our governor should be saying, welcome to New York City. We've been waiting for you. You are the best. You are the most incredible. You are the ones who are never going to stop because you've learned from your parents that they are going to sacrifice everything to get you to the American dream. You're going to go through jungles. You're going to have to cross that wall. You're going to be put in detention. It's going to be horrible. But you're not going to give up because New Yorkers are born hustlers. And that's who we want in our city. And instead, the message is, get out of here. This is the savior for New York City. This is the potential. And I'm one of those kids. Like, if you take away all the, I mean, that's why once I was you. Because, you know, yes, my dad was a genius who helped to create the cochlear implant at the University of Chicago, plucked from Mexico to do that. But, you know, I was almost taken from my mother at the airport in Dallas when we arrived in the United States in 1962. I was one of those kids who was almost taken from the arms of my mother because I had a rash and I was a, sorry, a slur. I was considered by law a dirty Mexican. So it could have been me that was taken from my mom and left in some room in the airport to be picked up and taken I don't know where. So it could have been me. I, don't, I see that it's just for the grace of God. But for all of us, 
And that's why I love what Holly's doing. We're just like, oh my God, I'm so fascinated. I want to know everything. I want to document this. I want to see it. Because what it is saying is potential, possibility, growth. Um, Basil, Basil and I were just talking because I'm like, yeah, I think the election's going to be close. But you know who I think is going to carry the election? Young Latino and Latina voters. Mm -hmm. That's who I think is going to carry it. And I believe because the issues of abortion and climate change are in their top five, I don't necessarily see that going red. So while everybody's complaining about young Latinos and Latinas and coming to our city and taking and taking, taking, actually, our democracy is depending on them. Mm -hmm. Depending well, our democracy, on them. Our democracy is depending on them. And, and that is really what uh, Jeff says in his book and what Paul said in a great uh, op-ed, too, where he, I, I don't know, you used the word stupid and crazy, or was that my imagination? What, uh, I said, only, only Paul Krugman could get away with that, you know, even in the New York Times, you know, that, you know, that we are so uh, uninterested in the future of our democracy, of our country, that we would let, uh, you know, millions of children uh, languish. Uh, Jeff, did you want to say anything about that? No, I, I, I want to emphasize a little bit uh, I want to talk a little bit about the child tax credit. I know some people close off to that because it's discussed so much. But it's a cash allowance without uh, uh, considerations, without demands, without questions. And it's worked. And I think that's what Paul was referring to in 2021. And all the rest of us have discussed this. This actually worked to cut child poverty, and it had results. Young kids were healthier. They weren't as hungry or hungry at all. Uh, it literally reduced suffering and raised the promise for the young. So let me ask you all about what to do next in a concrete way, not just to cheerlead them, but to get these kids on a path. Do you, want to address that first? I forgot his well, name already, I know. <laughs> so, uh. the, the very first thing that I would do is bring back the expanded child tax credit. Uh, as you said, it worked. And all, all of the metrics that you mentioned were true. You know, millions of children pulled out of poverty. Uh, food hardship goes to the all-time low that we've seen. Uh, parents' mental health improves. We now have a number of uh, peer-reviewed papers finding this. Um, the number of American families saying they could uh, handle a $400 expense hits an all-time high. And uh, one of my personal favorites, actually, the number of Americans with bad credit falls to the lowest level that we've had since we started keeping records. So the interesting thing, of course, is that uh, a cash assistance program that we had for decades was not that popular. Uh, it, the dependent children started in the, the New Deal. Um, of course, a, a program that looks an awful lot similar in structure is Social Security, which uh, you know provides monthly cash payments, and we saw elderly poverty just plummet. So we sort of see it work over and over again, right? Um, in, but I think one of the fundamental pieces that I really learned was uh, the child tax credit was also popular. Uh, something like 55, 60, 65 percent of Americans thought that this was good policy. And I think a big uh, part of that is that uh, we stopped doing the thing that we do in this country that's so different than most other Western countries, which is to segment and say, this is what poor families get. This is what middle class families get. And uh, when we make programs for poor families, of course, uh, then we have to do a lot of things to make sure only people who really deserve it get it. And in my home state of Michigan, uh, when you were so poor that you went to try to get $300 of cash assistance um, just a few years ago, you could, had to answer questions like the date of the conception of your child. So it's not just that we provided a small amount of money. It's not that we just made you answer question after question. We stripped people of their dignity. And I think programs that really try to take the exact opposite approach, right, and enhance people's dignity and start from this logic that child allowances all over the entire world start with saying, you know what, raising kids is expensive, and society has a reason to come alongside parents in that work. And we can empower families to buy the things that they need, just like Holly was saying, right? Some families need food, some need shelter. Uh, 
some families need diapers or childcare or more books, right? And so by giving families money, we're telling them that we trust them. And it's also a lot more efficient. Uh, we rolled out the child tax credit and the economic impact payments in weeks. Uh, three months we had to plan before we got child tax credit payments to 60 plus million uh, kids. Just incredible. We've never done anything like that before. Our housing assistance programs that had to be built up and made direct payments uh, to uh, landlords and had means test, it took months and months and months, like huge lag time. And those programs did Im important things too. But we don't need to spend all of that money on all of that ad administration, right? Mm -hmm. When we know things that can work. And, you know, if, I mean, I, I think before COVID, if you had said we could have a policy that brought child poverty to an all time low, that families would have better credit as a result, food hardship would be down, and you know families would be less anxious. Like, who would have believed it, right? But now we've seen what's possible, and we can look for small ways through state child tax credits, uh, municipal programs uh, like RX Kids, uh, to beat the drum until the opportunity comes to bring it back at the federal level. Yeah, Holly, I want you to address the, the amount of uh, money that it requires because it's reflective of what's going on in the economy because I remember asking you, you know, you started out with a $500 payment and decided you found out that wasn't enough to make a difference in a person's life. Yes, and so um, when we first started our first cohort two and a half years ago, we have done it in conjunction with the University of Pennsylvania Center for Guaranteed Income Research. And we had big questions around how much money is really required to your point, Carol. And so we did a group of $500 a month and a group of $1,000 a month. Um, and what we saw was that the group of $1,000 started to access childcare at much higher rates. They reentered the workforce. Um, their savings went up. That wasn't as surprising. There was more money, of course, but their mental health was also improving. And they were seeing Penn Center for Guaranteed Income Research was running pilots out in California as well, in LA, not with mothers. Um, the Bridge Project is the largest program in the country for babies, but they were running it just on people, and they were seeing very similar things. And what I think we all postulate in this data is, you know, at $500 a month, it's not enough money to pay for child care to be able to actually re-enter the workforce. But at $1,000, it starts to make some meaningful differences. I think the other thing we've always felt was very important is to have a longer runway. Because what we see in the beginning is the moms, it goes into a bank account, they have a debit card, they can take it out whenever they want. In the first months, they tend to take it out very, very fast. They don't trust that that money will be there tomorrow. But as time goes on, about the month four to six, they start to realize the money's going to stay. And so I think this longer term time frame as well allows a woman to start to plan and to think about what this means. And we just had a mom, you know, I think we always talk about food, diapers, vegetables, being able to access um, a hospital. But we just had a mom who told us she had been saving six months of her money to be able to leave a partner that she thought was going to kill her with a four month old baby. And so you think of both the courage and the resilience of that woman. Um, but she said, I've never been able to leave. All the accounts are in his name. The lease is in his name. Um, I have an infant. How do I support ourselves? Um, and so I think, you know, of course, it's diapers and strollers and safe sleep spots. It's also this dignity that you're talking about, Luke, of giving people the ability to say, I am in charge of my life and this child's life, and I'm going to do what I need to do. But that requires more than $500 a month in New York City. In New York City, right, right. Whereas with uh, in Michigan, in, the, in your community, the, the, the $500 is substantial enough to make a difference. Uh, Paul, Paul, I want to ask you, uh, though, about uh, a couple of things that are happening. We still have uh, some big decisions to make in Congress before it, the end of the year. Uh, what well, makes there, you think we have a Congress, but anyway. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I know, we say, use the word. Uh, I don't know, I mean, and, and when we read about what is intended to be cut, uh, it's just staggering that a food for children uh, and for families, uh, home, you know, rent uh, subsidies, uh, all of the things that, were, that are so essential uh, to our children are on the chopping block. I mean, what, what, uh, look, what amazes me about this is that there is not, as far as I can make out, 
a, a really large constituency of ordinary Americans who want this. That the, it, if you ask people about issues, people tend to be in favor of supporting children, of, of supporting the poor. What we are really are talking about is a kind of, um, uh, this is a, a kind of a, a s elite supported by, you know, it, 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 I don't want to quite say conspiracy, but they're, they're clearly, these are not mass public demands. The, uh, actually, one of the mysteries I always find is, is why, we talk about populists in US politics, but why aren't there any actual populists? Why are there all these people who you know, cater to popular prejudices and fears, but never actually uh, you know, uh, 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 advocate actual po popular policies? It, uh, it's not entirely, a, in, in Europe it does exist. In Europe, there are people who you know hate immigrants and and uh, and are kind of uh, blood and soil nationalists, but also favor generous child allowances and so on. In the United States, that just doesn't happen. And I can th give you some stories about that, but it is amazing that we are contemplating this. If and a lot of it, I think, depends on the the fact that voters have no idea. If you actually ask if how many people actually know what the Republican Study Group was, you know, has been advocating. I think that must, uh, I doubt that it's, it's even one in 20 New York Times readers, let alone the general public. Right, right. So, and, and Jeff, one of the things that, that you always ask uh, on our podcast and in your book, you know, is uh, why does America hate its poor and hate its children? Why do, why do they hate? Do I talk about hate? I think that one might be a little Well, it's, uh, it's very disturbing to me. I think a lot of this has to do with the color of people. A lot of this has to do with uh, um, a sense that these people are simply not responsible and you can't make them responsible. And there's so little evidence that that's true. There's so much evidence. They want the help. They want to take care of their children. And for anybody who doubts that, go read the real literature on this and how much people spend on their kids when they get these allowances. And it's true in Europe also. They want to take care of their kids. They want the kids to have a chance. And as many people advocate, including Paul and Luke, and I think certainly I know of Holly, and I'm sure you do as well, Maria, Mm -hmm. It's Maria. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Um, it's better for the country. These people become productive workers. They become happy. They start businesses. They work for others. So let's get it right. We know how to do it. And we dedicated this podcast to getting this right. And uh, it's amazing how many majorities there are in America that believe in some form of welfare state, from helping the poor to helping those burdened with an unwanted pregnancy, and on and on. Can I just say a word also? I think sure. Luke's point is uh, what, what you've been talking about. It, it's astonishing to me how the public image of the person who benefits from programs that help children is still an inner city person of color when so many of them are now rural whites in, you know, the, in the left behind parts of America. Holly, did you want to talk about that? I, I can tell that you do because... <laughs> Trying to be good. We have talked um, about this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think two things that were going through my head. The, um, well, as Carol knows, we're headed to Appalachia in 2024. So um, a big slice out of Connecticut and a big chunk out of Appalachia. Um, where I grew up. But I think, you know, the other bit that was going through my head is people also, I think, believe this is somehow a problem that is intractable and we just need to learn to live with it. And I think what's interesting is like when I talk about Connecticut, there are 3,300 babies born into the state of Connecticut and into poverty a year. So we're going to take 500 of them next year. So like we're down under 3,000 now, right? Like we could do this with some will. We could even do this as private philanthropists for a period of time. Clearly, it is not sustainable over decades, but I think that's part of what the Bridge Project wants to do is to show people that this is actually solvable. Um, and it's solvable child by child, city by city. 
And I think, you know, certainly in Appalachia as well, that's an important demographic that everybody says the rural white poverty, which I understand well, is going to be important to help push on the federal level. Yeah, Luke, I, I was very moved by your section uh, in your book on Appalachia, the sort of uh, subhuman uh, characteristics that the, uh, the white Appalachians were considered to be, uh, you know, working and living in the company store and really, truly subhuman. Uh, you know, we think that most of us think that that's the way people could perceive, um, you know, people of color, you know, but here in Appalachia, it's this essentially the same idea working. And talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a big part of the argument we make in the book, is the book really uh, traces, it gets to know communities in uh, eastern Kentucky, central Appalachia, in the Cotton Belt, uh, in the Mississippi Delta, in uh, South Carolina, and then in South Texas. And Maria, I know you've been doing, some, doing a lot of thinking about South Texas as, as well. And uh, these places have all been studied separately, but uh, one of the arguments we make is that the stories really should be linked. They're all places that were dominated by a single industry. An industry, by the way, that didn't just matter for the region, but with cotton, with coal, with tabletop vegetables in South Texas, uh, they mattered for the entire country, and in fact, the development of the entire world as cotton goes overseas to the UK. Uh, they were all dominated by a single industry controlled by a small group of people that required a large labor force. And so a set of practices were put in place to enforce that. And the ones we know the most, and rightly so, is slavery, followed by Jim Crow. But uh, the migrant uh, farm laborers in South Texas also had uh, sub-citizenship. They were uh, stripped of their rights. Uh, those communities were controlled by uh, Anglo farm owners and ranch owners and in, in Appalachia as well. So you can trace a lot of this dehumanizing of uh, sort of uh, Appalachians and uh, as a way to sort of become okay. And this gets at part of the reason why I think um, there is a, lot of, is a lot of hate for vulnerable groups is because uh, we, we need it. We need to dehumanize as a nation to make uh, what is true okay and to enforce the sort of the practices and, and the way that the world is that, that benefits a certain segment and honestly benefits us as a nation. Maria? Yeah, no, I mean, I think the issue of, I mean, it's ugly, but the truth is is that um, the demographic change in our country is something that has, I mean, what's the greatest wound in the United States of America, right? It's the racial division that we have yet to understand. Um, and, and people, I think it's important to put into context when we, um, when we all heard the, the voices, uh, because of a great ProPublica Pro piece, when we all heard the voices of the babies and toddlers and children who had been taken from their parents at the border, um, and we were all so horrified, but the truth is is that this country has been taking away children since the beginning, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something that you all are gonna freak out about, so I'm giving you warning, <laughs> giving you warning, because what I'm gonna say, you're gonna be like, ah! But it's for the context of this conversation, right? So if you look at the United States from our founding fathers and mothers, which are the first peoples of this country, right, indigenous people, then um, the people who arrived, i.e. the pilgrims, well, they would look at them and say that they're the people who came here are actually the first illegal aliens ever to come into the United States, right? When that happens, right, indigenous babies are then taken from their parents at that point, right? And then that's repeated. By the way, I'd, I'd be interested with uh, Paul in this conversation. I've, um, I don't just say slavery. To me, slavery is international, corporatized, government-supported human trafficking. Right? So we all have to kind of be like, oh, everybody's like, oh, if you see something, say something. Well, our country was built on that. Right? So those children were being taken away from their parents. In, and then Japanese Americans' childrens were being childrens children were being taken away. So this is this is part of this notion of we're a changing America, and we don't want to see it change. And therefore, who do we do we really want to help them? Especially if it's increasingly black, uh, indigenous, uh, Latino, maybe speaking English with an accent. We don't. 
they're coming. I mean, the narrative that I'm getting, even I live in Harlem. I'm a proud Harlemite. Oyeme, I'm even hearing from my black cab drivers up in Harlem. I don't know if we want these immigrants here. You know, they're taking everything. They're just coming. They're getting all that free ride. And I'm like, wow, that this is happening in our city, right? Especially with many of the immigrants and refugees who are arriving are black. So part of what we're talking about and the importance of this panel, right, is to correct the narrative, right, that actually poor children are not takers, right? They're not looking for a handout, right? They actually want to be the most productive possible. And we all have to be in the process of dismantling these narratives that are repeated over and over again, which are untrue, right? So for me, just, just to leave it at this, like for me, it's an old joke, but I think you guys are New Yorkers, you'll enjoy it. But it's a little shocking too, so I'm warning you. <laughs> so we all had to come to terms with the fact that a man was running for president um, on lies. Just his opening lines about Mexican immigrants, I'm a Mexican immigrant, right? That we are, we're criminals and rapists, et cetera. So not true. We know this, right? Because the data shows it actually, immigrant communities are safer than communities where US citizens live. But anyway, the joke is that, um, that during the Trump administration, I was five things that he disliked actively, right? So Mexican, immigrant, journalist, woman, flat-chested. <laughs> okay, that's it. I just needed Paul, to make people laugh a little Paul, bit. Paul, did you have a, uh, Maria was uh, drawing you into that. Uh... No, I mean, well, first of all, the substantive thing, I, actually I'm, I'm doing some, some background research for something that will eventually show up. Uh, um, and, and part of the question is why New York City is kind of miraculous. It's, uh, it, it has, it is the safest place in America has half the murder rate of, of other major cities. Uh, it also has extremely high life expectancy. And I've been trying to figure out, and I think a very large part of it is the prevalence of immigrants in the city who are, who are more law-abiding and, and, in general, healthier. Because who comes? People with, who, who are venturesome. And it's a, uh, yeah, it, it is a, by the way, I get, I get amazing hate mail, you know, as, as you might imagine. <laughs> but the best is, is when I get some of the sort of, um, like Sheriff Joe supporters, and I, the, my, I treasure the, the, the letter I got that said, you, you don't understand what it's like on the border. How would you feel if New York City was full of Im immigrants? <laughs> uh, um, uh, the other thing, I just, all of this, I, I can't, I can't. That, do people still listen to Tom Lehrer songs? They, you know, on the, the National Brotherhood Week, and the, the, the choruses, you know, the Hindus hate the Muslims, and, the Protestants hate the Catholics, the Catholics hate the Protestants, and of course the last line is, and every, everybody hates the Jews. Great, well we yeah, are well, um, yeah, at taking some questions from the uh, audience, and I think we've got a couple of microphones going through. Jeff, while, um, while we get our first question, did you want to add anything at this point? I did, I, I have one friend who's an MIT professor, he's a white man, he's uh, highly educated, and when I was telling him I was writing a book about child poverty, he said, are there poor kids in New York City? <laughs> and I'm not, uh, I'm not exaggerating, am I? Okay, uh, Brianna, do we have a question? Uh, you mentioned that at one point there was the legislation that was in place and the empirical data seems to support that the level of child poverty went down and that as a result there was a change and that the, this legislation which seems to be wonderful uh, was not renewed. Um, what were some of the forces uh, that were used against the evidence as you present it and the legislation from not being allowed to continue if it has all these positive ramifications for it? I mean, Jeff and I, yeah. Are, are familiar with the role of evidence in, in influencing legislation. And it, it is, <laughs> however low it you can imagine, it's less than that. I guess, Luke? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just address a couple of the issues. So uh, it fell one vote short among Democrats. Uh, 
And uh, I believe some of the concerns were that, uh, that people would use money for, for drugs or opioids. Uh, that's uh, an interesting one because there's, uh, especially with the child tax credit, which is a modest amount of money that goes to families, there's no evidence to support that. And in, in fact, some countries you actually see uh, substance use go down uh, when, when money arrives, thinking that actually sometimes uh, uh, substance use is a response to stress. And so if I have a little bit more money, I'm a bit less stressed. Um, I think there may be some evidence of a, of a small spike uh, around the economic impact payments, which went to everyone and uh, were quite large. Um, there's also a spike in opioid deaths when Social Security uh, checks go out, so I guess we would have to get rid of those if that's what we were really concerned about. Um, another issue is around inflation, and I'm probably, I, I don't know that I should sp speak to inflation, but the child tax credit in particular uh, is a small amount of money on a monthly basis, and so it's actually particularly designed to have the, the least amount of inflationary impact possible. Um, and then, of course, there was a question of, oh, if, you know, if, a, if a mom and a dad get an extra $500, uh, are they going to stop working? Uh, we now have a number of papers that suggest um, that that is silly, uh, that uh, in fact, like that's not enough, not enough money. There, there may have been a small employment effect, but uh, many of the studies are coming out at a zero uh, effect. But you know, those are going back to a lot of what we talked about, the narratives, these, these are, I could have told you those would be the concerns years ago, right? And so these narratives have a long lasting and in our book we see in all of these places the narratives that sort of lead us not to have these policies are, are the same. You know, we have quotes from the 1800s about saying, you can't give you know, benefits to poor families, they'll stop working. So, uh, you know, it is a bit sort of uh, of an evidence-free sort of thing. Great. Next question. Yes, Hel Helene or thanks, Helene. Hi, um, my name is Helene Goldfarb, and I'm an alum of Hunter from 72 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how poverty seems to breed poverty, so that the next generation becomes poor again. How do we teach the parents so that they get out of poverty? We can feed kids as much as we want, and I believe in that 100%, but how do we move them out of poverty? Well, well, that's a big one. That's a big one. Well, but, but you know what, I actually, I mean, to me, yeah. I'm like, well, a yeah. job. Yeah, right, the economy, I mean, I, Helene. I understand that, but how, how do you get, how do you, it's like, it's, to me, it's, well, yes, education, but what, in my experience in reporting in communities that are oftentimes not seen, it's like, people want to work. That's the first thing. So how do you do that? I mean, I don't know, hmm. WPA? Uh, <laughs> anyone? Um, but I'm just saying that how do you get them out? It's, it's one way is that understanding that they do want to work. And almost all of the uh, the poor are, are, are working, but working two or three jobs at substandard. Right. So oh, I'm sorry, want to work one go, job? Right. If you go if you go to the food banks, you know, I mean, we interviewed the Brian Green from the Houston Food Bank. They feed a million people, uh, who and two thirds of whom are all working. You know, and so it's it's our economy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Talk. <laughs> So talk, talk to us a little bit about how do we no, change Can our, I just say, I, yeah. when I was, you know, what, once upon a time, there was a lot, a lot of talk of, uh, and everybody here knows more about poverty than I do, but the, you know, people used to talk about cultures of poverty and used to talk about, and I believe that that has been largely refuted by experience. I mean, it, 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 William Julius Wilson was right. I mean, that basically, um, and if, if you like, if it, if, if people who thought that the problem of inner city poverty was something cultural, how would you test that? that a, an extremely unethical human experiment would be to take a group of rural white people and deprive them of economic opportunity and see if you develop social dysfunction. And guess what? It turns out it's, it is overwhelmingly just lack of economic opportunity. It's not, it's not about 
parents being bad parents or anything. It's, it's you know, jobs. Now, how, how you bring jobs to depressed regions, that's a much harder question, but, but it is about money and jobs. Do we have time for one more? I should just yeah. say one thing. The idea of a culture of poverty that um, makes poverty persist is a disturbing myth. And yeah. it started some time ago. It started in the Latino communities by uh, uh, prominent academicians, and it spread to the black community. I, some very well-known progressives talked about the culture of poverty. Who's that guy, columnist from the New York Post, no longer with us, famous lefty. You knew him well. Okay, he's looking right back, you mean uh, Pete? Yeah, Pete Hamill. Right. Culture of poverty. He's huh. a culture of poverty guy. Huh. I won't mention a few other names, because there's- Let's not get into People right, are yeah. sensitive about this. Actually, I'd love to Thank hear the names, but okay. Thank you very much, <laughs> Jeff Madrick. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right here, let's, let's get a mic to you. <laughs> Thank you. I was just wondering, how do you combat those, I guess, misconceptions about just poverty, or the culture of poverty, but also, yeah, just that. Like, I mean, we've talked about it a lot, but there's no solutions that have been presented, so, yeah. Well, try to tell the truth. Try to show studies that it does, that it's not a true issue. Uh, a lot of people have done this. And, uh, and a lot of people have written misinformation about it who were highly considered left-wing economists, in, in fact. So Luke probably has something yeah, to say. We're, we're yeah. wrapping up, so I'll, if we could do a quick, a quick round table about that, uh, that just to zip Yeah, through. I think just super quick. I, to me, it's a matter of how we build our, our welfare state. And we have done a lot of segmenting off programs for the poor and then giving other things to other folks. And we should have bigger tent policies. So welfare that gave money to poor families was incredibly unpopular. The child tax credit that gave money to poor families and middle class families was pretty popular. Social Security, the, the most successful uh, anti-poverty program we've had in this country, incredibly popular. So looking for ways to make the tent bigger and not pit people against each other with our policies uh, seems to generate a lot more support. Maria, quickly. Yeah. So if you think about uh, the mainstream media that we all consume, the mainstream media, um, you know, it's run by, uh, sorry, Paul, but like white guys <laughs> who come from privilege, right? Um, and, and some of these guys are my best friends, right? But, but they have been raised, right, uh, hearing these things about a culture of poverty, culture of, uh, suddenly they're the editor-in-chief of the New York Times, and they're like, well, there's a culture of poverty, and they're repeating things. So how do, we, how do we bust that narrative? One, you repeat everything that you heard here and clarify in these conversations, and then you have journal, that's why Rep representation, diversity, class difference among our journalists is so important so that they can say, actually, not that way, it's this way. And that helps to change the narrative. Paul, what privilege were you raised with? I forgot. No, I mean, but it, well, I mean, I, I, I was born in a generation when it was not, in fact, a disadvantage to come. But look at what people said about um, East European Jewish and Southern European immigrants at the turn of the the 20th century. They were a subhuman, they were incapable of advancing, they could never be assimilated. We've been through this many times before. The Irish in general, the Irish yeah. in general were yeah, of course. compared and to uh, monkeys. Yeah, but, but can I just say that I agree that the um, simplicity, universality, less, I mean, it's odd that conser in conservatives want government programs to be extremely intrusive, find out everything about you and, and dictate your life when, as opposed to just give people money as a right, which is, and those programs uh, are both much more dignity and they end up being popular. Everybody, everybody ends up accepting them as just a, a, a fact of, of, of what life in America is supposed to be. Holly? I was gonna answer the question of, I think we need to use our head and our heart. Yeah. So I think we have a lot of head data. We, we have plenty of data that should say our heads should prevail, but they don't always. And I think part of this is, I think where Marie and I were forming a fast friendship is around narrative. And so we could tell you that mothers use the money well, but people will still say to me, I, I don't know, right? 
And so sometime I tell one quick story that I'll tell you, which is we have a mom in the program that when we ask her how much money does she have in her savings, she says she has $20, and it's hidden from her partner. And we said, why $20? And she said, I will never touch it because I have my older child has severe asthma. The ambulances are very slow in my neck of northern Manhattan. And that is my money to get this child to the hospital in the event of an asthma attack in the middle of the night. When a woman is trading off how to save a child's life versus whether she should buy diapers or protein, I can guarantee you she is going to be a very good steward of that money. And I think it's more of these narratives we also need to get out in addition to all the head work that we know and that we continue to do. Thank you, thank you all. I, I think, think we I've, are uh, yeah, at the we're end. We're gonna wrap it up. I yeah. think everybody on our panel and everybody in our podcast is dedicated to reducing child poverty sharply. We know the issues, we know the damage it does, and we know that many people who are blamed for child poverty are blameless. Uh, He's such a great writer, you know? I've, I've got mean, a little... Uh, I, you know, it's true, it's true, it's true. He's the best writer. Here, want, let me... Hold that for me. <laughs> <laughs> so any, in any case, perhaps nothing would heal America mor morally. America morally, I can't read. I hate to say what I have, <laughs> but my hand shakes. <laughs> it's a symptom. It. You know it, you wrote it. Uh, no, no, here, I'll just... We're friends for many years. We argue like this in the podcast. You can tune in. Usually our editor edits out most of the disagreement. But to, uh, cut, uh, to cut poverty sharply, a first requirement would be to develop an appreciation of the potential of the millions of poor people to have some faith in the poor. As the great philosopher Amartya Sen, an economist, argues, poverty is, quote, unfreedom. Molly Orshansky, the prime developer of the American poverty line and a former member of the uh, Social Security Administration, insisted that her poverty line was not one above which people will escape hardship. Rather, and I'll close on this, it should be one below which no one should live, Thank and we're dedicated to that. See what I told you about the great writer there. So in, in Invisible Americans, the tragic cost of uh, child poverty. I should have please. added this to my intro to Paul. <laughs> what makes him so successful is he is such an accessible writer about subjects that are often difficult. Right, right. So thank you to Luke, Maria, Holly, uh, Paul, uh, and to you all for being with us. We have two more uh, convenings scheduled this fall here at Roosevelt House. On uh, November 15th, we're doing something with the Economic uh, Hardship Reporting Project, uh, Alyssa uh, Court. And on December 13th, with Holly Fogel. Uh, really, truly expanding on the question, is cash the answer? Let's say, let's give them the money so they can live. Thank you all so much for being with us. <laughs>